Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Paul is going to testify again. He's still speaking before this large group who has assembled, assembly of, of prestigious people, a king, a ruler, those within the military of high rank, the prominent people of the city, and also a multitude of others. See, God has positioned Paul, this willing vessel. And that's how we need to be. Understanding that we have been purchased by the blood of Messiah. That there is a call upon our life. That He is our Lord. And therefore, we should be obligated with joy to participate in His will. That's what happened to Paul as he has testified on that road to Damascus. How his life was, was forever changed. And now he has given that testimony and he's going to continue by speaking to this group, especially to King Agrippa. Now, you might remember something. A couple weeks ago, when we were coming to the end of, of our study, Agrippa's finding out that it was Paul in prison. He had said to Festus, that he always wanted to hear from Paul. And remember, Festus says, you wanted to hear from Paul, you shall hear from him. And when we look at the text, so frequently we find that Paul is addressing King Agrippa. He knows of his influence, the prominence that he has within the Roman Empire. And Paul understands the significance of what can be brought about if this one comes to believe. So having shared this testimony of this Damascus Road experience and the calling that he received out of it, Paul now responds directly. Look, if you would, Acts chapter 26, and we're going to pick up where we left off last week in verse 19. Acts 26 and verse 19. Paul is speaking and he says, so that. Now, really, it's a word of continuation. In light of this, I did. That's the intent of what Paul's saying. So that King Agrippus, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now, this has great implications. First of all, what Paul is saying is, he received a heavenly vision. And the, the proof of that, he has said, is how his life has been transformed. The change from his personal theology. How he went from believing that believers in Messiah and persecuting them and the purposes of Yeshua. How he has been transformed not to be against it but to participate with it. A powerful change. What caused it? Well, he says, I was not disobedient to what? This heavenly vision. He wants him to understand that this is revelation from God that he's responding to, and that Paul is committed to it. Look now to verse, verse 20. So what did he do? He said, but to first Damascus and after Jerusalem and into all the regions of Judea and then to the nations and what did he do now it's very important the order of what's being revealed here 
Now, many times the order is not to teach us that there is a, a specific chronological thing that we need to do in, in responding to God. No, sometimes based upon the context, something is being emphasized. But here, this is fairly foundational because as Paul spoke, as Messiah spoke, as Yohanan Hamadbil, that is John the Baptist, they all began by speaking about repentance. Remember what Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 says? As Messiah began his first proclamation, he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance, foundational in our transformation. That's where it begins. So Paul went throughout all of these regions. He says in this scripture, verse 20, first to Damascus, then to Jerusalem, and in all the area region of Judea. And then the implication is after that to the nations where he proclaimed repentance. And repentance also turning upon God. Now, two things I want to say here. Not turning to God, but turning upon. It is a word of foundation to stand upon. And that's what Paul is doing. His life is based upon a new foundation. He stands in a different location. And it's with the God and the definite articles there. It's so significant in the scripture to see when God is referred to as the God. And that's what Paul is emphasizing. Remember, much of whom he's speaking to, this audience is idol worshipers. But Paul is saying there is one God and he's the foundation of my life. He is what I stand upon. So he proclaimed repentance and turning unto God and having uh, works, practicing works worthy of repentance. Now, let's highlight for a moment that word doing. Now, I translate it practicing because it is a different word from the normal word poeo, which is to do something or to make something. This is where we get the English word to practice. And that implies an ongoing, not I've done it and I'm finished, but it's something that is a, a manner of behavior, a, a lifestyle. And it's very important when I look at this verb, and it's a participle, I see it speaks about something that is, is ongoing continuously. And what is that? As he says, there's a connection to bear works worthy of repentance. Now look at verse 21. On account of this, me, and I'm going to go with the order of the Greek text. On account of these things, me, the Judeans, seized in the temple and wanted or, or attempting, trying to do what? Well, it's a word I realize that the King James, for example, says kill. But if you study this word, it's a word to place hands upon and the prefix dia, which means thoroughly. Now, was it their desire to put him to death? We've seen over and over and over. That's what they've wanted to do. But here, it's simply the term to put hands upon in a thorough way. They were seizing him. And I do believe their intent, as I said, was to see his death. So they were attempting to, to seize him. But what happened? Look at verse 22. Now, this verse is, is truly enlightening because Paul is standing before rulers. Those who could say to him, Paul, you're worthy of, of being put to death. And they could do it, and that's it. No more. Paul would be done away with. 
But Paul is speaking to them, and he's not intimidated. He's not scared. He's not full of anxiety and stress. Paul sees this as an opportunity. He is sharing four decisions, and that's important. You do the same thing. I can remember many, many years ago, I was talking to, to this older lady, and she was, was considering the gospel. And I talked, and I talked, and I talked to her. And she, well, and I don't know. And, but here's the problem. I never said, you need to make a decision. Are you going to reject this and be forever, ever disappointed with eternal regret? Or are you going to accept this message of good news and be forever changed and ever glad, rejoicing in the eternal presence of God? That's the heart of the matter. And Paul always understood that he was seeking a decision. And even though there were those who wanted to put him to death, you know, there was a testimony. And these individuals would have known this. Why? Well, if you go back up earlier in the text, you'll find here that there was not only a king and a sister and a ruler and prominent people, but if you pay very close attention, you'll find here that there was also these, what some would say, are these chief captains. Remember, they're a military term. Speaking about those who ruled over a thousand. I mean, there were many people there. And one of them knew something. And that is that there was a plot to put him to death. Remember what we've seen? We've seen that Paul had great security measures placed around him for this transfer from Jerusalem to Caesarea. Now, it's really not men that's bringing this about. Paul recognizes something. Look at the verse that we're in, verse, verse 22. Therefore, help I receive from God until this day. I stand testifying, testifying to both the small and the great. Now, what Paul is saying is, you know, those seeking my life, that's nothing new. But I have had time and time again help, help that I've received from God. Deliver me out of the hands of others. Why? Well, Paul says it right here for exactly of what I'm doing now. And that's testifying to the small and to the great. And notice what he says. See, Paul is constantly going back to the message. And he's saying, and he's very clear, we look at it, he says, nothing other being said than what also the prophets have spoken in regard to what will be, and not only what the prophets said will be, but who else agreed with them at the end? And Moshe, that is Moses. So Paul, and so frequently this is the case, when Paul speaks about his life, having come to faith in the Mashiach, in Messiah Yeshua, what does he say? I have spoke nothing, and realize who Paul is. He was an expert Pharisee. He knew not only the traditions of the elders, this oral tradition which had been written down in his days, but Paul knew something else. He was very well acquainted with the word of God. He, as was said earlier, he was someone who had studied diligently. And what did he say? None of what I am speaking is contrary to the prophets or Moses. Now, when I looked at this and how it's written here, I mean, many English Bibles, they change the order because they, they don't want to just tack on Moses at the end. But that's exactly what the Word of God does. And here's my explanation for why it's constructed 
of course, by means of the Holy Spirit in the way that it was. Well, Paul clearly said nothing against Moses. I want you to hear that. He's testifying. He says, none of these things are against Moses. But the emphasis is, none of these things are against the prophets either. And the way that this sentence is constructed, let me say it a different way. The way that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to say it, and or for Luke, presumably the author of Acts, to write this down is to put a strong emphasis on the prophets. And frequently, this is what I try to communicate to, to you all. The importance of prophecy. It's through prophecy that we get a proper perspective of the person, Messiah Yeshua. And not just his personhood, but also what he's going to do, what he has, and what he will do. So once again, look at verse 22 at the end. Paul says, nothing other than what's being said by the prophets, which is about what they revealed about what was going to be and also Moses. And what was that? Look at verse 23. Now, Paul, he could easily defend this. A true believer we should know the word of God in order to make a defense. And Paul says, when you look at the Torah, but especially, especially when you look in the prophets, you find out something. You find out about a suffering Messiah. See, so many of the people that I talk to here in Israel and in the Jewish community, I mean, that is a struggle for them. A, a Messiah that dies? I mean, they are very acquainted with the teaching of Rabbi Moshe Mamadides, the Rambam, who incorrectly states, and his statement is also in conflict with the Talmud, because he says, you know, if someone is, is presumed perhaps to be a candidate for the Messiah, but if he should die, that eliminates him. No, it does not. The prophets, in fact, demand that there is a, a Messiah, the Messiah, that comes and dies, rises and returns. The Talmud allows for that as a possibility, but the prophets demand it. And that's why he says, speaking about the prophets and the law, that is Moses, that, that Messiah suffered. And here again, it's not a Messiah, but the definite article, the Messiah suffered and was the first one from the rising, the resurrection of the dead. That light was about to be proclaimed to the people and to the nations. Now, pay attention to this because what we see here is that, that Paul is revealing the order. First to Israel and then to the nations. Whenever it speaks about the people, it's talking about the Jewish people. That's what the New Testament does, and we should affirm that and understand it. Now look, if you would, to verse, verse 24. Now, verse 24 speaks to what I mentioned earlier, and that is that Paul studied diligently studied the writings and what is this ruler going to say look if you would to verse 24 these things he was making a defense so with these things Paul was defending who he was what he had done why why has he changed in this way and notice that that Festus he spoke in a loud voice and he says crazy is Paul now it uses a phrase that can mean insane and why did the Festus think that that Paul was insane well he says the many writings of yours meaning what you have studied 
your much learning has caused you to become turned to insanity. Now, that's how a lot of unbelievers think, that pouring over the word of God, it will make you crazy, that a person must be insane to spend so much time in this book, if they only knew, if they only knew. Notice that Paul responded back. But if you look at verse 25, it's very significant. And this is why looking at things in the original language is so vital. Because some will say Paul, but Paul doesn't appear, that name, in this, this sentence. No, once again, it's the definite article. It's speaking about this one. But the reason why Paul's not there, that name doesn't appear there, is to teach us something. Now, I mentioned last few weeks ago about Kingdom Hope College, a college that prepares people to study God's Word. And there's a class that you can take. It is from Dr. Leland Riken on the Bible as literature. And when you understand the literary devices that this scripture uses, the Bible is literature, God-inspired, God-breathed, inerrant word of God, perfect from the heavens. But it uses devices in order to help us arrive at the proper understanding of its, of its truth. And therefore, therefore, the fact that Paul's name doesn't appear there, but the definite article, yes, it's speaking about Paul specifically, but the literary device that is being employed here is to teach us that this is true for everyone. And what is true? Look at this verse. He is not crazy, he said. Now, in this case, it's, it's him speaking. I'm not, but it uses the definite article, the one. He says, I'm not crazy, O oh, excellent Festus, but the truth and the sobriety of the words, meaning scripture, I proclaim. That's what he was doing. He says, this isn't me. This isn't some philosophy that I have. This isn't some understanding that, that I discovered. No, this is the promise. What an important word. And we're speaking about a promise. And notice the next word he uses. I would translate it as most Bibles do. Sobriety. That is that which is sound. That which is founded upon truth. So it's a promise of, of truthfulness. And he says, if you keep reading, not only that, these are the words that I proclaim. And verse 26, he gets very, very precise. He says, for you understand concerning this. You have understanding of these things. Who does he speak to? O king. He says, you understand these things to which also I speak. And the word here, now again, some of the scriptures, they, they do not take seriously the simple meaning of the word. I was uh, responding with my wife to a, a very interesting email that we received. And it has to do with translation. And I, as you know, are much more appreciative and feel it's much better to have a word-for-word -word translation. And the email from a, a nice gentleman said, well, you know, that's a matter of interpretation because you have to choose the interpretive word. What word goes with that? And sometimes you have choices. He's right. But here's the problem. Instead of just dealing with that one word and finding the right definition of it, Instead of going word by word, if you go kind of passage or phrase by phrase, what you're doing is you're not dealing with the individual words. What you're doing is kind of just taking it lumped together. And instead of saying, what does this one word mean? You have to say, 
how should I interpret not just the meaning of these words, but the intent? There's a big difference. It is much better, yes, it, it has to do with the frailties of, of human beings. No, we choose whenever we translate. It's a step down from the original. But it is preferred to simply look at an individual word, looking at the context of Scripture, to come out with the best definition, rather than taking a group of words and rendering them with a phrase to capture what you think the meaning is. Because one is truly an interpretation, where the other one is simply a discerning of a definition. It's very different, and that's why I stand strongly by a word-for-word -word translation rather than a phrase-by-phrase a phrase when we're really paraphrasing rather than translating. So we read here, and Paul says this, O king, to which also I speak, and some Bibles will say freely. It's not freely, but it's a word for being bold, that he speaks boldly, or another legitimate uh, translation would be confidently. So freely misses everything. Freely is a perfect example of someone reading this and think, well, Paul here spoke, spoke freely. He spoke just from his heart. But the literal Greek word has to do not with speaking freely, but rather speaking boldly and confidently. I can speak freely and be very, very mistaken. But the word here speaks about a confidence that he had in what he's sharing. These things are important. So once again, he says, For king, you understand concerning these things to which also boldly or confidently I speak. And then he's going to go in, and this next part of this verse, verse 26, is, is difficult to translate word by word. And what he's saying here, and let me do the best I can with it because it is difficult Greek in putting together. It begins by, by something which is hidden. For that which is hidden of these certain things, he says, I am not persuaded that none of these things were, were put in a corner. Now, what's he trying to say? He's saying, what I'm revealing to you about the truth of the prophets, what also Moses testified to concerning a Messiah that was going to die, and the proclamation that leads to repentance and turning to God, all of these things, the resurrection. He says they're not hidden. They have not been put in some corner that, that you can't find them. He says you know these things. You've heard about them. They're not foreign to you what else we'll look now to verse 27 paul continues to speak and he's speaking to king agrippa now obviously we have festus calling him uh, uh insane festus wasn't so interested in this discussion he was just seeing a rational way that he could pass it on to to caesar in rome but do you recall Agrippus says that he wanted to hear Paul. And therefore, Paul is directing primarily his words to Agrippus. But obviously, with the purpose for all there, that they would hear and respond. But verse 27, O King Agrippus, you believe the prophets. I know that you believe. Now, notice he doesn't say, all the scripture, which is obviously part of his intent. We just don't evaluate or elevate one portion of scripture over the other. That's wrong. But Paul is emphasizing for understanding Yeshua, understanding God's prophetic program, understanding what's going on. It's the prophets who testified to it more boldly, clearer, than any of the other authors. And therefore he says to King Agrippus, O King Agrippus, 
the prophets, you believe. I know that you believe. And this word is related to faith. Verse 28. But, and this is this word in contrast to, Paul says, I think you're a believer, aren't you? But Agrippus, he said to Paul, in a short, and this word means brief, in a little. And what it means is, you think in a little amount of time? Now, once again, the King James, the translation that I like, many places here in this passage, the King James fails. Because the word here, and let's deal with it, you can look at it at yourself. It's the word oligo. Oligo, if you check it out, means briefly, shortly, a few. What does the King James says? Almost. And it doesn't fit the context. It is a perfect example of desiring something that Paul almost led this man to the Lord. That's not what it says. If you read it carefully, this is what Agrippus says to Paul. He says, in a little bit, in a short time, me, you will persuade a Christian to be, that's what it literally says, the order, once more. Agrippus says to Paul, in a little, in a short, or in a few, meaning a few words perhaps, me, you persuade a Christian to be, and notice Paul's response. But Paul said, alavai, now that's Hebrew, it's not Greek, but that's probably the, the best word that really fits the Greek word, which is, I desire this, I wish this, I want this to be the reality. What's that? That he would have accepted Messiah. So Paul says, once again, verse, verse 20, 29, Paul said, I, I wish to God, whether in a little bit or in much. So Paul says, you know, I really don't care how long it takes. It's a term of commitment. Paul says, I'm committed. If this isn't enough time for you, I'll speak more. I'll get with you. I'll share more. But he says, whether in a little or whether in much. Not only you, speaking about the king, but also all the ones hearing my hearing me this day. So Paul says, you know, it's just not about you, O king. Also, on my heart, Paul's addressing Agrippus. But on his heart are all those, everyone who is hearing him speak this truth. So Paul says, I desire not only you, but all the ones having heard me today that they would become, and the idea here is of this same type as I am. That they would have this same perspective, the same commitment, the same faith as I have. He says only one thing, except without these bonds. So he's almost being humorous. He says, you know what? I desire everyone to have that same faith that I have, to be like me, but not in chains. Now that was kind of a little dig almost, saying you need, you need to realize I'm not worthy of chains. And they're going to agree with this. Notice how the scripture concludes. Look at verse 30. We read here, and these things he said, meaning probably Paul, king stood up, and the governor, and Bernice, and all the ones who were sitting with them. Now, this would have been the aristocrats, the, the leaders there, both of the military and of the government, perhaps also these prominent people from the city that were also invited. So look again, it's after he said these things, the king got up and the governor and also Bernice, also the ones sitting with them. 
and they withdrew and they spoke one to another saying that nothing worthy of death or bonds meaning those chains this man has practiced or is practicing so they look here and they find this man is not a menace to society he's not out to bring harm he's not speaking something specifically against caesar fact he wants to go to caesar and share these things he is committed to them because of two reasons one he's a jew and he knows the jewish scriptures secondly he's had this experience with a risen a risen messiah and this has put him on a different a new course and he's passionate see that's why it's so important that we see that paul spoke not just freely you know that is at ease but rather he spoke confidently and boldly with a passion now that word conveys both of those things to be confident about something and to be passionate about it and these individuals they saw this in paul that he had done nothing again worthy of death or bonds look now to verse 30 uh, 32 but Agrippus said to Festus, it would have been possible to release him, to set him free, this man. Let me say it again. Agrippus said to Festus, it would have been possible to set this man free, except that he had appealed to Caesar. Now, that's where the chapter ends up. But we can't conclude until we understand the hidden meaning of this, of this text. Now, I say hidden because for most people, if you're studying in the language that you speak, whether it's Spanish or Russian or, or Hebrew in this case or English, see, if you study this in any other language but Greek, you're going to miss out on something. My wife and I, we have a, a good friend, and he lives in San Diego. I'm speaking about Ronnie Hulan and his wife, Nikki. Now, they are assisting us in doing something. He came up with this idea of a radio program called Lost in Translation. And I love this name. And I love what it's about, showing that there are indeed things lost in translation. Because we read this and we say, well, you know, it's a shame. Paul could have been released. He's not guilty of anything that requires us to hold on to him or put him to death. We could have released him. He could have been out of here. But he appealed to Caesar, and therefore Caesar, he must go. Well, when you look at this word for having appealed, you need to do a study. And there's things like the Discovery Bible, Bible Study Company, and others that you can go and you can look at words more closely. You can understand the grammatical implications. Because if you just look at this word and you don't look at it in the original language and in the grammatical construction that, that the Holy Spirit caused this word to be in, you miss out because this word when it says except he had appealed to caesar this word for appealing well it is in the plue perfect and i've shared with you one of the nuances of the plue perfect has to do with remoteness now remoteness can be seen in a lack of understanding you're far away, remote, far away from, from understanding, from perceiving, from being able to, to grasp what's happening here. You see, they look at it, and it's almost as an unfortunate thing. You know that Paul, 
He, he made a mistake. He should have never appealed to Caesar because if he hadn't, he could be set free. But because he did, he's got to go to Rome and such. How unfortunate. That's their thought. But the scripture, based upon the pluperfect, gives us an entirely different understanding. They didn't grasp it. They were far away from what God was doing in this passage. And what was that? God placed it upon Paul's heart, as we saw earlier, several weeks ago, to appeal to Caesar. And one of the purposes of that is to get him to Rome. Why? Well, Rome is the center of the empire that was ruling much of the world. It was strategic. Now, I'm a bit, when it comes to certain things, I'm a bit of a cheapskate. I hate paying for things that I don't have to. And Paul, I believe, had that same tendency because he could have went to Rome on his own, paid the ticket, or he could appeal and be taken there by the Roman Empire. And it just wasn't about getting to Rome. He also wanted a hearing with Caesar in a similar way that there would be an event that Paul could testify of the gospel, testify of Messiah, demonstrate the change that has gone through his life. I mean, think of it. Paul, he has suffered much for his faith. Now, just because someone's willing to suffer for something doesn't mean that that validates it, but it shows a commitment. And oftentimes, a commitment stems from one's sincere convictions. Now, someone can be sincerely convicted and be wrong. But Paul's basing this on the Word of God. He's basing upon heavenly revelation, both written heavenly revelation and also that Damascus Road experience. No, Paul, they didn't understand it. But Paul is wanting to go before Caesar, so that he can go as it was told to him back in Damascus with Ananias who, who prayed for Paul and prophesied to Paul, Paul, you're going to take the word to nations and to rulers and kings. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. God is so good. God is so faithful. When you seek him in obedience, when you come before him, humbly when you come before him dependent upon him saying God whatever you want me to do I'll do and I'll trust you to supply everything I need God will move people God will bring about things God will show himself he delights in showing himself faithful showing himself to be a blessed God so let me tell you this get up that's what, what the Holy Spirit said to Paul. Get up. I've got a plan for you. I have a purpose. He stood Paul upon his feet and he gave him a call. And if you are willing to respond to that call, if you're willing to commit now, unbeknownst to you what that call might be, but if you say, God, I'm in it. I'm all in. Everything that I have, everything that I am, I lay before you. Use me for whatever you want me to do. No matter how big, how small, what the world might think, what other people might perceive from it, it doesn't matter. I am confidently and passionately committed to you. And let me close by saying that such a commitment becomes only possible having met Messiah, just like Paul met Messiah on that Damascus road. And I challenge you, if you are not a believer, but somehow you're listening right now, my, my counsel to you, my most sincere desire is that you would say, yes, I am a sinner. And you can just say that right now. Yes, I'm a sinner. And I am without hope. God, I have failed you. I have rebelled against you. You can just say those things. God, I have failed you. I have rebelled against you. 
But now I'm trusting in Messiah. Say that. Now I'm trusting in Messiah. The one who died upon that, that tree. Who laid down his life. Who was buried. But on that third day, he rose again. I accept him. I invite him to be the Lord of my life. And I want to serve him. If you confess that, believing that you're a sinner and trusting in the blood of Messiah for forgiveness, and you, you receive it faithfully, by faith, the grace of God, your name at that moment is written in the Lamb's book of life, never to be erased, never to be erased. And you can have assurance that you'll be in the kingdom of God. And God wants to begin a new work in your life, a transformation. He'll put you on a new course, a different course, and he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Serving God, it doesn't get better than that. Trust me. In the blessed name of Messiah Yeshua, we all say amen. Until next week, when we gather once again at midnight from Jerusalem, for the study of God's word and for worship. Until that time, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.